Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Sydney Corridors. I'm a member of the Black Caucus at the School of Social Work. Hola, everyone. Hola, everyone. My name is Jasmine Tolar, and I'm the member at School of Social Work. Thank you so much for coming, and welcome to Police Terror Must Stop. Which side are you on? We would definitely like to get started with the program. Um, thank you so much for being here once again. This is an amazing event, um, and we are thrilled to have you here. It's going to be a great night. We'd like to just start off with uh, introducing Jamal Joseph. He has a speaking engagement to go to um, following this event, but he was able to come here um, and, and still speak and, and represent, and we appreciate it. So I'm going to just introduce him a bit, and then he can speak a little bit, and then um, we'll continue with the program. Sounds good? Jamal Joseph was a 15-year-old Bronx honor student when he joined the Black Panthers in 1968. At 16, by, at 16, he was in prison with the legendary Panther 21, and would later serve more years at Leavenworth, where he earned two college degrees and found a new calling in prison theater. Now, a film professor at Columbia University and former chair of their graduate film program, as well as a recent, recent Oscar nominee, he tells the remarkable story of his transformation in Panther Baby, a life of rebellion and reinvention. He is the executive art director of the New Heritage Theater of Harlem and co-founder and, art, and executive artistic director of Impact Repertory Theater, which has which has mentored over 1,000 Harlem teens, providing an artistic voice for their lives and a constructive channel for social activism. Mr. Jamal Joseph. Rise up, October. Columbia University used to be the place whenever somebody, no, no, but tonight is the place again. Yeah, okay. So our activists, young and old, know what I'm talking about. When something happened in the 60s, Columbia students would shut it down and open it up, it was important. It was important that not only would they shut the campus down and shut the classes down and take over buildings and take over College Walk, but they understood the message and the importance of solidarity so that the community would be here. Working folks would be here. Unemployed folks would be here. Welfare moms, the Panthers, the Young Lords, Iwakum, AIM, all the groups would be here. I remember as a young Panther being uh, in, uh, on the steps of Low Library and uh, the students had shut it down. It was, uh, uh, this particular uh, moment was an anti-war protest and uh, the statue, alma mater, was blindfolded with the North Vietnamese flag. And so uh, the Panthers were like kind of last to speak that day. We, you know, I knew my job was to kind of really get the crowd going. And I said, if Columbia University doesn't recognize, you had to have that 60s cadence in your voice, <laughs> that the war in Vietnam is a war of capitalist exploitation, brothers and sisters, and that the United States pig military is occupying Vietnam the way the New York City pig department is trying to occupy New York City and Harlem, then we have to do more than take this campus over today, brothers and sisters. We need to burn the damn place down. And the students would be like, Um, fast forward 40 years, I was uh, walking the class. I'm a professor uh, right across the walkway at Dodge Hall in, in the graduate film program. And it's, uh, it's one chilly morning, and I hear somebody go, psst. And I look around, and it's, the students are not hanging out because it's chilly. None of my colleagues are there. I take another step, and somebody goes, psst. And I look up, and it's the statue of alma mater. And she was like, oh, it's Professor Joseph now, huh? <laughs> I remember when he was trying to burn the damn place down. But what we witnessed and what she witnessed was the power of the people. And what we understood about those gatherings in those moments, and a big round of applause for the brothers and the sisters 
who was on the committee from the School of Social Work and the other schools who fought relentlessly. <laughs> who fought relentlessly so that the university recognized that this is something to open the doors to, you can't turn it back because you cannot turn back a moment when it is time for liberation and truth telling and organization and change and progressive change. That's right. Our job tonight is to witness and to act on that. Something that we said in the movement is that all theory is based on practice. And so you could be a brother and sister who was in the movement at that time and have all the theory in the world. You could recite Fanon and Mao and Malcolm, but there could be a brother and sister who could barely read that was in the street at those community programs, working in the jails, working at the welfare centers, working at those buildings where there were rats and slum laws doing that, and that brother and sister would get this badge of honor, they would say, that brother and sister may not be very educated, but they're a damn good worker. They work for the cause of change and liberation. So the context that I want to set is that I know we will be fired up by what we hear in terms of why we are gathered. And as to deal with state violence in the form of the police department that is not here to protect people but property, we understand that. We understand the difference to how police act in, uh, in, in wealthy communities as opposed to how they act in poor communities. We understand the difference between how police treat black and brown and yellow and red and yellow people as opposed to how they treat white people. We understand that if you are a white person with a black person, that for that particular moment you'll be an honorary nigger too. <laughs> in terms of being beat down, in terms of being profiled, and in terms of being thrown in, if you even dare to stand up for your friend. So it used to be a time that the, that the privilege of race and the privilege of class would protect you, but our police force is so out of control that no one is safe. But for the people that are on the front lines, here's what this must mean. And here's why a gathering like tonight at Columbia University is important. The other places that we have been, the churches and the community, the other schools is important because we are looking into the faces of the people and we are understanding the power of the people. And what must happen in Rise of October is that we have to get people out so that the powers of oppression know that the next time they stop a black or brown boy or girl that the next time they stop a poor person or a homeless person, the next time they harass them, they're not just looking into the eyes of that one particular person, they're looking into the eyes of all of us. That's what the power of the people is. And yes, we have to use social media, we have to reach people by any way we can. We have to canvas by the phone, but we've got to do that groundwork to say that at a certain point, at this point, nothing is going to be more effective than for us to flood the streets so that they can understand that the city and this country is rising up in October. That's trying to secure this room. Um, and we are very fortunate that we did, but it was, it honestly, was truly a struggle. And we just, we wanted to invite a couple students to, up to kind of explain why the struggle was so worth it. So if Ali, LaViolet, can, can come up here, please? Good evening. Um, such, such an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Ollie, and I'm studying to get my master's in social work here at Columbia. Um, I am here tonight to request that all citizens of this nation feel safe in their own homes and are treated fairly under United States law. We live in a society that appears progressive and equal to those who do not want to see the truth, to those who are afforded ignorance 
The reality is that we are living in a time of disgrace, an era in which it is acceptable for a person to be killed because of the color of their skin, a society that shrugs its shoulders at, a sens at senseless murders and perpetual cycles of corruption in our police force. American citizens are terrified of those that are supposed to keep us safe, whose job it is to prevent us from harm. People are continuously taken advantage of by the government and are treated by authority as undeserving, powerless, and voiceless. Racism plagues every sect of the criminal justice system, resulting in hundreds of unwarranted arrests, life sentences, and lost lives. To demand an end to the cruelty, we must stand hand in hand as human beings whose freedom is bound in one another's. We must fight for those who no longer remain with us. We must listen to each other, open hearts to one another, and seize this moment to change for all. Thank you. Also, can Christina Vega, Karma Loeb, Alia Don, Lursa Jacobo, Paulina Solis, Ian Arkeson, Jean Charles, and all the other students volunteer across Columbia schools please stand to be acknowledged for all the work today and leading up to this very important event? Please join me in giving them a round of applause. challenge you guys I'm short okay before we transition introducing our panelists I'd like to speak a bit about why this is such an important issue to Columbia student Columbia University became the first university to divest interest in private prisons this was a monumental achievement in the issue of mass incarceration Columbia University staff and students we are making history our next panelist Eve Ensler is a Tony Award-winning playwright activist, author of the Vagina Monologues. Eve Plays includes Necessary Targets, The Treatment, The Good Body, The Emotional Creature. Her books include Unsecure Alas, A Political Memoir, I Am an Emotional Creature, and her latest critical acclaim memoir, In the Body of the World. She's, co she's founder of V-Day and One Billion Rising, a global mass action campaign in over 200 countries. Her plays, OPC, recently had the world premiere in the American Repertory Theater, where she will also debut and perform in the body of the world based on her memoir in spring 2016. Her newest short play, Avocado, opened to rave reviews this summer. She has written numerous articles for The Guardian, Time Magazine, and much more. She was named one of Newsweek's 150 women who have changed the world and The Guardian's 100 most influential women. Please join me in welcoming Eve Ensler. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I feel so energized, happy, honored, privileged to be here tonight with you and with these amazing people up here. Yes. And I am rising up October 24th. Yes. And I am rising up because we are living in a country where we have a state instigated terror, state that is controlling, demoralizing, murdering, undermining the lives of black women and men. And it needs to stop. I was reading Martin Luther King today in preparation for this, and I was thinking about how much he talked about how to awaken the conscience of white people to the suffering and denigration and lack of rights of African Americans in this country. And I was shocked last year to see how we have to keep reminding ourselves that we are living in a country where the practice of slavery denigrated our brothers and sisters for so many years that threw them into the next paroxysms of further oppressions and denigrations. And now we are seeing the in, in, incredible extremity 
of that oppression. I spent the day looking at the video of Tasha McKenna. And I have to tell you, I've seen a lot of terrible things in this country. But that video, for me, is the epitome of everything that needs to change in this country. Everything. We have a woman who is clearly mentally ill, has been mentally ill her whole life. A woman who is being held in a cage where she's already been so traumatized that the first thing she says to her captors dressed in biohazard suits because of their fear of touching a black woman, first thing she says is, you promised you wouldn't kill me. So we know she's already been traumatized and terrorized. In that video, they pull that woman out stark naked. It doesn't occur to one person of the seven people dressed in their biohazard suits and gas masks, maybe to cover that woman, to give her dignity, to say to that woman, we see you, we feel you, we understand your pain. We understand that you are suffering mental illness and we are with you on this journey, no. What they do is they sit on top of her and they shove their knees and they shove their elbows and they shove their bodies and they shove their beings into that woman who is stark naked, screaming out for someone to see her pain. And then what do they do? They start telling her to stop resisting. Now what does that mean, don't resist? That means love your subjugation, love your denigration, love your rape. Love your demoralization. This is America. That is state-controlled, instigated violence. There were seven people who walked out there and participated in that act. And then, with Natasha McKinnon, with the last life force pulsing in her, refused to die just on a passive death, they took their tasers their tasers, and zapped her naked body over and over four times 50,000 shock waves into her body while they covered her head. It was Abu Ghraib all over. Covered her head and then wrestled her down, tied her into like an electric chair, drove her outside where she was probably already half dead. And you know what? No one noticed. Because not Tasha McKenna wasn't a real woman. She wasn't a real person. She was a story. She was an idea. She was a racist projection in their minds. And I'm sorry, if we all in this country don't understand that Natasha McKenna is our sister, she is our sister. That could have been any one of our sisters. She's our sister. We are part of that story that killed Tasha McKinnon. And if we're not on the streets October 24th and you don't bring every single person with on your streets, this police state will eventually come for all of you, I promise you. Rise, 24. So this is real, y'all. Where we talk about these in our talk about it in our classrooms or don't talk about it in our classrooms. This is real life. So we're gonna rise up October 24th. And I did just want to send a reminder about um, the sign-up sheets that were placed in your seats to so please sign up to get involved. And next I'm gonna introduce Mr. Nicholas Hayward Sr. On September 27, 1994, Nicholas Hayward Jr., at 13 years old, was shot and killed by a New York City housing cop in the housing complex where he lived with his mother, father, Mr. Nicholas Hayward Sr., and younger brother. Nicholas Jr. and his friends are playing a game of cops and robbers in the stairwell of the Gowanus houses, 
using plastic toy guns with bright orange colored handles and tips. When Officer Brian George came upon Nicholas on the 14th floor stairwell, Nicholas dropped his toy gun, saying, we're only playing, we're only playing. But Officer George shot Nicholas in the stomach. Nicholas Hayward Sr. is an endorser of Rise of October. Thank you. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I am honored to be here today, despite the fact this is a very sad occasion for me, and it should be for you. I've been out here for the last 21 years battling for justice for my son and the many, many other innocent, unarmed victims who have been gunned down senselessly by police all across this country. Nicholas Jr. was just playing the game of cops and robbers with plastic toy guns that didn't look nothing close to a real one. They were plastic, colorful guns. But when the district attorney, uh, Charles Hines, closed the case, instead of presenting the guns, that the toy guns that the children were playing with, which looked colorful and plastic, didn't look real at all, he went to different toy stores and collected a bunch of uh, plastic toy guns that looked it like real weapons, and he presented that at a press conference to show uh, that toy guns are dangerous. Mind you, toy guns are not dangerous. It's the police that are terrorizing us that are dangerous. This is something that we really must come to know and understand of the reality of what is actually taking place here in America. Because me, myself, I mean, it's very painful, me, painful for me to, uh, to constantly, like I said, it's been 21 years. I never, no one could have even told me that I would be out here this long battling and fighting, which this is supposed to be a civilized nation, that I would be out here all of this time uh, battling, fighting for justice for my son and the many others that have been murdered by uh, police worldwide. I just came from a, a vigil for Mohammed Bosch, who was gunned down senselessly just two years ago. And in the 21 years of my struggle and fight, I see a process that's, going, that's being presented over and over and over again. We have vigils, we have protests, we have rallies. But yet, the, the height of police brutality and murder is rising. It's not stopping, it's not slowing down, and it's up to us to put it into this. Yeah. I, say this, I say this with authority, we must organize ourselves collectively. We must be out in the forefront to put it into this. I say rise up October 24, because I want to put a stop to this. I do not want the next generation to have to go through the same process mm, right. that we are going through today, that our ancestors went through prior to us. This must stop, and we must organize ourselves to put an end to it. We all must get involved. We all must rise up October. We all must let people know to be out there October 24th. It's very important to you and the nation, we must put an end to it, we must stop it. Since the last, <clears throat> let me say, since um, my son was murdered, there has been over 374, that's just in New York, New York, the city of New York alone. We're not talking worldwide. The book Stolen Live documents worldwide since the 90s to, the, to 2000, and this right here is escalating, like I said, I don't know the direct answer, but I know that appealing to the city, the state, and the federal governments, which I had already did, it falls on deaf ears, it falls on cover-ups, and nothing, nothing ever gets done. Nothing ever gets done when you, uh, you make those appeals to the city, the state, the federal government. Despite the fact that my case after 21 years is right now being re-looked re into by our district attorney, Ken Thompson, but um, he himself, he works for this system. And I have no faith or trust in this system. 
I'm not even going to tell you that. Because like I said, since I've been out here battling, struggling, I haven't even seen one single case of justice done to not one single case. Everyone wants to make their pleas and, uh, and go before the federal government, the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice in 1999 sent me a letter that uh, stated that they were closing, they, they, invest, they, did, they say they did an investigation on my son's case, and their investigation consisted of looking at the investigation that the DA did. Mm. That's what their investigation consisted of. The federal government, the Department of Justice, caused their investigation looking into what the DA did. Now, mind you, I don't know how many of you are aware of Charles Hines. Charles Hines was running a corrupt office, and he's under indictment today. So that in itself, that right there in itself should tell you this system must come down. We must start from scratch. We must build it up and put an end to this police brutality, police terror, and murder that's in sweeping this country. And I say that, I mean, as a father, I've been out here struggling with these mothers. I don't know where the rest of the fathers are at, but I feel that pain. I mean, my son was just 13 years old. He was an honor student. He, I mean, I know I was doing the right thing, raising him right, and trying to, you know, put him, place him in the right direction. He already had his mind set on being a basketball player and a doctor, all which is well in his reach. And then I have to have a coward ass cop gun him down. Innocent, he dropped the toy gun, he said, we're only playing. We're only playing, he's told us, God. And mind you also, the kids that were there told me that Nicholas, <clears throat> the cop said, asked, he asked Nicholas, what you're doing here? He asked him, and when Nicholas replied, we're only playing, we're only playing, he shot and killed him anyway. Mm. What kind of society, what kind of system is that? Why is this guy still on the force? How is that possible? And why must we still continue to fight and rally in a system that we know we're not going to get no justice under? Rise up October. Let's show them that we are tired of this and we're not taking it no more. Thank you so much for that narrative and that testimony. Kimberly Crenshaw, professor of law at UCLA and Columbia Law School, is a leading authority in the area of civil rights, black feminist, legal theory, and on race, racism, and law. She's the founding coordinator of Critical Race Theory Workshop and co-editor of the volume Critical Race Theory, Key Documents, The Shape of the Movement. Her groundbreaking work on intersexuality has traveled globally. Crenshaw has worked intensively on various variety of issues pertaining of gender, race, and domestic globally. Crenshaw has worked intensively, oh, I read that already. Domestic area including violence against women, structural racism, inequality, and affirmative action. In 1999, she co-founded the African American Policy Forum to house a variety of projects designed to deliver research-based strategies to better advance social inclusion, which was recently published, Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women. Please help me in welcoming Kimberly Crenshaw. <laughs> I want you to join me. No justice, no peace, no racist, no justice, no racist. Do we mean it? Yeah. Do we mean it now? Yeah. And what are we going to do October 24th? Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. Now. There's something else I want you to do for me when you rise up. I want you to. Say her name. 
I want you to say her name and his name. But in order to say her name, you have to know them, right? So do something with me. I'm going to ask everybody to raise their hand. And when you hear a name you don't know, put it down. Honestly, put it down. So let's start. Eric Garner. Mike Brown. Tamira Anderson. I mean, Tamir Rice. Freddie Gray. Michelle Cusseau. Tanisha Anderson, Maya Hall, Ara Russer, Kayla Moore. All right. These were women who were killed in the last year. So tell me something. How are you going to say her name if you don't know who they are? How are we going to have a movement for police accountability when we don't know the narratives that put women as well as men at the hands of racist police? How are we going to do that? So one of the most important things we can do as a movement is to know their names in order to say their names, right? And that means that we have to make a commitment to ourselves not to rely on the media to tell us whose lives matter. For us to say when black lives matter, we mean all lives, black women, queer, transgender, gender nonconforming, cis, these are the women that count. Right? So if we're going to do a little self-education about how to say our names, we need to know something about them. So let, let's think about what are the frames that are available for us to remember how black women also lose their lives, because we know something. If you give people facts without a frame, they will forget the facts, right? So what are some of the frames that we have that we use to think about, conceptualize, and contest the way that black bodies are made vulnerable to state violence? Well, some of them we know. Driving while black. Right? We can name black men and boys who have been killed driving while black. Can we name any black women who have been killed driving while black? Well, what about Melissa Williams? Melissa Williams was killed along with her partner that she was driving with in Cleveland, Ohio. Car backfired. The police mistakenly took it as gunshots. They chased them throughout Cleveland. When they finally stopped, an officer ran up on the hood of the car Altogether, they unleashed 130 rounds at those occupants. He unleashed 49 alone. Said he was in fear of his life. You don't jump up on a hood of a car when you're in fear of your life. Melissa was killed instantly. That's a woman killed driving while black. When we say her name, we need to say Melissa Williams. What about the fact that black women are killed not only when they are occupying public space, but black women are killed in their homes, in their front yards, in their houses, in their bedrooms, in their beds. So that's another frame we can have. It's the public-private frame. Black women, like women, experience things in the private arena because of who they are, because of their gender. So let's talk about a few women who've lost their lives at home in front of the people that love them. Tanisha Anderson, black woman, Cleveland, Ohio, killed a week before Tamir Rice. You don't know her name. Same police force that killed Tamir killed her. What happened? Her family called because she was having a mental health crisis. The family called for help. The police arrived, decided that they were going to take over the situation with coercive force rather than treating her as a woman in need of help. Tried to put her in a police car, tried to put her in a confined location, tried to separate her from her family. She resisted. They did a, a takedown move on her, threw her to the ground on the cement in the dead of winter in Cleveland, Ohio, kneeled on her and she died. Her death was ruled a homicide. You need to know Tanisha Anderson's name. Say her name, Tanisha, Tanisha Anderson. Anderson. Tanisha. 
Tanisha Anderson. Tanisha Anderson. Michelle Cousseau. Michelle Cousseau. Michelle, Cousseau. Michelle was another woman whose, whose, whose family called the police for help. She would missed a mental health appointment. When the police got there, she decided she didn't want to go. She locked them out. The police decided this is not sufficient for us. We are going to take over this situation. They beat down the door, knocked down the door, ran in. The police officer encountered her in the hallway. He said, holding a hammer, and he shot her through the heart. His justification? It was not any move that she made, no threat that she made. It was the look on her face. The look on her face. When did we hear something like this before? Mike Brown, he, it, monster. Women are not immune from that. It's race that makes certain bodies seem to be animalistic, seem to be in need of control. Women fall within that same kind of stereotype as men do. She died in her own foyer because of a look on her face. Say her name, Michelle Cousseau. Cousseau. Say her name again. Michelle Cousseau. And let me tell you one other woman who died in her own home. Kayla Moore. Kayla Moore, transgendered woman in Oakland, California, also having a mental health episode. Roommate calls the police for help. The police decide to run her name for a warrant for a warrant. Her birth name comes up. They decide that they're going to arrest her rather than give her the help that they need. She said, I have no warrants on me. I'm not going anywhere. The police decide that this is someone who's resisting. They swarm her, throw her down on the bed, and she ultimately dies from this swarming technique. Kayla Moore. Kayla Moore. So we need to broaden our frameworks because we understand that while a significant dimension of police violence has to do with the containment and repression of black masculinity, there is also a whole range of ways in which police make women vulnerable because of where they exist in this world. So black women are killed because they are poor. Remember Eleanor Bumpers? Yeah. Shot to death? When? During an eviction. Margaret Mitchell, shot to death. Why? Because she was pushing a cart on a street. She was a homeless woman. So black women are killed when they need help. They're killed when they're incarcerated. They're killed when they are seen as smarting off. Remember Sandra Bland? Right? And they're killed at the intersections of race, gender, and poverty. So what we need to do when we march for police accountability is realize that it's a broader set of issues that make us vulnerable. Realize that all black lives matter. Realize that to make that clear, we have to say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Thank you. research to do. I think we, a, a few of us do. Let's make sure, say her name. Get the report in the back of the hall. Yep, there is a table right in the back, my, my left. I'd like to now introduce Mr. Carl Dix. Carl Dix is a co-founder of the Stop Mass Incarceration Network. He spent his life opposing injustice. He is a representative of the Re Revolutionary Com Communist Party. In 1970, he was one of the Fort Lewis Six, the largest mass refusal to go to Vietnam by U.S. soldiers during that war. He spent two years in U.S. military prison for this stand. 
Mr. Dix has been a leader in the fight against police terror in the annual October 22nd marches to stop police brutality. In, two in 2011, he and Dr. Cornell West called for mass nonviolent protests at, New at, New York at NYC police precincts with the highest rates of stop and frisk, contributing to mass public opposition in the, in the practice. Along with Dr. West, Carl put out the call for the October 2014 Month of Resistance to Mass Incarceration, Police Terror, Repression, and the Criminalization of a Generation. In August and October 2014, Carl joined mass protests in Ferguson, Missouri against the police murder of Mike Brown and was arrested while standing with the defiant ones. With Cornell West, he has issued a call for a national shutdown for 14-15 to stop murder by police. Rise up. Thank you for that introduction. We've heard tonight about what happened to Nicholas Hayward Jr. at the hands of the police. We heard about what happened to Kayla Moore, Michelle Cousseau, Tanisha Anderson, Melissa Williams. We've heard a number of horrors. I've been on tour promoting Rise Up October. Through the course of this tour, I have interacted with a number of family members of people murdered by the police. I just want to mention a couple of them. I just came back from Waukegan, Illinois, being with LaToya and Alice Howell. Six months ago, they buried 17-year-old Justice Howell, the son and grandson of LaToya and Alice. He was shot in the back twice by police. Also on this tour, I interacted with Samaria Rice, the mother of Tamir Rice. Eight months ago, she buried her 12-year-old son, Tamir, gunned down by police. Also on this tour, I was accompanied for a while by Myrtilla Jones, who five and a half years ago buried her seven-year-old granddaughter, Ayanna Stanley Jones. In none of these cases have any police been punished in any way. These are not isolated incidents. It happens all the damn time. They amount to an unspeakable horror, an unspeakable horror that must be stopped. Now, to get into what we must do to stop police terror, I want to start off with a quote from Bob Avakian, the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Here's the quote. There is the potential for something of unprecedented beauty to arise out of unspeakable ugliness. Black people playing a crucial role in putting an end at long last to this system, which has for so long not just exploited, but dehumanized, terrorized, and tormented them in a thousand ways. Putting an end to this in the only way it can be done, by fighting to emancipate humanity to put an end to the long night in which human society has been divided into masters and slaves, and the masses of humanity have been lashed, beaten, raped, slaughtered, shackled, and shrouded in ignorance and misery. That's the quote. The quote talks about horrific ugliness and the potential for great beauty. The ugliness is real and it's painful. And it's not just what the police do to black people and Latino people especially. There's also what was done to the native inhabitants of this land. Their land was stolen from them. They were nearly wiped out. Those few who survived were put into concentration camps they called reservations. There's what is done to women in this society with its rape culture, with viewing women as sex objects. Yeah. 
and with the interference of government authorities in the very private decisions around when and whether to have a child. There's what's done to our immigrant sisters and brothers. Driven here by the devastation that the U.S. wreaks in their homelands. And then arriving here to face persecution. Deported in record numbers by Obama and insulted by fascist idiots like Donald Trump. And then, and then there are the wars for empire. Wars in which one million people were killed in Iraq over the past two decades. And before that, three million people in Vietnam. And before that, three million more in Korea. And look, when I talk about their wars for empire, I know something about this. I was in their military. I saw how they broke people down tried to turn them into mindless killing machines for their wars. They tried to do that to me. When they told me I had to go to Vietnam to kill Vietnamese people for this system, I had an answer for them. That answer was, hell no, I ain't going. <laughs> so I know something about that horror. And then there's also the way that they're devastating the environment of the very planet that we live on. All of this, all these horrors, need to be and can be ended. See, and when I say that, I'm, this ain't me saying, well, we'll get justice some far off day. Humanity can be emancipated. And the way to do that is through revolution, through getting rid of this system and bringing in a system that's based on freeing people from all the ugliness and developing whole new ways for people to relate to each other and to the whole world. Now we saw the possibility to make revolution in the 1960s when black people stood up against the hell being enforced on them, sparked broader resistance and rocked the whole system back on its heels. That the potential to defeat the power of this system was shown in Vietnam when peasants organized and inspired, defeated the powerful U.S. Army. And part of how they did that was by inspiring soldiers like me to rebel. Back then, we questioned everything and we wanted to change everything. We saw glimmers of a new way for people to relate to each other. We saw some of that beauty that Avakian was talking about in this quote. But we didn't make revolution in this country. In places where revolution was made, power has been seized back by capitalist exploiters. And people around the world have paid a heavy price ever since. A lot of people got beaten down and gave up. Today we face a situation of mass incarceration. 2.3 million people in prison. There were crack and AIDS epidemics. Today, 40% of black children live in poverty. But this is where Avakian comes into the picture, because he never gave up on the people and never gave up on revolution. In fact, go ahead. Brother Avakian, go ahead. Avakian developed a new approach or a new synthesis to how to make revolution and bring new societies into being. An even more scientific understanding of the methods of communist revolution, of its goals, strategy, and a plan for doing it. And on the basis of this new synthesis, we in the Revolutionary Communist Party are building a movement for revolution. So I challenge everyone here tonight, get into Bob Avakian, check out what he's brought forward, check out what he's saying, and get with this movement for revolution. And you can do that by going to the website revcom.us. Now, coming from the need for and possibility of revolution, I understand that we got to bring everybody we can together to take on the hell that this system is bringing down. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, what you think the problem is, what you think the solution is. We got to stand up, we got to fight. We cannot allow ourselves to be beaten so far down that we could never rise up and do anything about 
what this system does to us. And this is the approach that we have to apply and we are applying through Rise Up October. Because look, we're at a crucial turning point. There's been an inspiring protest movement that's developed to police murder over the past year in this country. But the authorities are trying to beat it back down. They hit it with mass arrests. They threaten people who were arrested with heavy charges. There's a brother here tonight, Noche Diaz, who has been facing arrest after arrest, <laughs> threats of years in jail for the crime of standing with people and calling out the terror that the police are bringing down on him. We can't allow people like that to be snatched away, but even more than that, we can't allow our movement of resistance to be suppressed because either the authorities will get away with suppressing that movement and the killings will not only continue, but they will intensify, or we will take to the streets in even greater numbers with much more determination and beat back these killers and their suppressive program through acting to stop police terror. Now, sometimes when I go out to people and talk to them about Rise Up October, they say, well, protest was good, but we passed that now. It's now time that we have to reform away the problem. And see, look, I don't think you can reform it away. Like I said, it's going to take revolution, nothing less. But if that's where you're coming from, actually get that even to get somebody to listen to you about reforms, you actually got to take to the streets. You got to say to them, we ain't going to take this anymore. You have to show them people determined to refuse to live like this anymore. And then we can debate and discuss exactly what it's going to take. But we have to stand up and we have to say we're not going to take this. That's what Rise Up October is about doing. It is about changing the way that millions of people in this society think about the problem of police getting away with murder. It's about rocking those who order and carry out this terror back on their heels. It's about drawing a sharp line in all of society. Which side are you on? We gotta put that question to everybody. And when we act in October, and I'm gonna tell you in a minute exactly what we're gonna do in October, we will be telling the whole world that we are not going to let them put our movement back into a cage of begging them for change, of lining up behind some savior or other and hoping they'll change things, or of passivity, but that we're coming at this stronger than ever and we're refusing to tolerate it anymore. We'll be sending a signal out to the whole country and to the eyes of the world that we are not going to take this. We'll be saying to everybody who wants to fight, there is a movement and there are people who will fight with you if you stand up. We will be opening the eyes of those who are sitting on the sidelines, saying they're sympathetic and saying, sympathy, that ain't good enough. Move to act. Change up. Get out there with us to change this stuff. This is the signal, this is the message that we have to deliver. Because what they're doing to us, these killings, are the spear point of a whole genocidal program of suppression. It's illegitimate, it's immoral, it must stop, and it is up to us to stop it. And Rise Up October will be a big leap towards doing that. Now what we're going to do in October, let me break it down. Three days of powerful resistance. October 22nd. In the morning of October 22nd, in Times Square, we will say their names. We're going to gather family members of people murdered by the police, together with prominent voices of conscience, artists, clergy, professional people, and we need to have some students out there too, standing together and saying the names of the men and women who have been, had their lives stolen by those who are sworn to protect. That is how we're going to kick off Rise Up October. Then the afternoon on October 22nd, here in New York, there's going to be a demonstration in Brooklyn, starting at Borough Hall, moving to uh, Barclays Center, marking the National Day of Protest, the 20th Annual National Day of Protest, 
to stop police brutality, repression, and the criminalization of a generation. And there will be similar marches happening around the country. Friday, October 23rd, we are going to carry out a nonviolent direct action. When I talked about this before, I said the details will be upcoming. Well, here's a big detail. This action will focus on shutting down the butcher shop concentration camp debtor's prison that is Rikers Island. That's what the 23rd is going to do. And then, Rise Up October will culminate in a huge march Saturday, October 24th, with thousands upon thousands of people descending on New York City from around the country, joining with thousands upon thousands of people from here in the New York City area, and together through the sheer weight of our numbers, shutting New York down. We're going to gather in Washington Square Park, march to Columbus Circle, right through the middle of Manhattan. That's what Rise Up October is going to be. And look, I want to applaud the work that the students here did to make tonight possible. That was very important. But now that I've applauded you, I have to tell you that your work is not done. You've got to spend the next two weeks realizing the vision of a powerful outpourings of resistance in the streets of New York City aimed at stopping police terror and challenging people with the question, which side are you on? We need you to be reaching out to everybody you can. Not just electrifying this campus around Rise Up October and bringing out hundreds and hundreds of students, you got to reach back to all of your friends that you knew outside of college. Reach back to the people you went to high school with, to your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, everybody that you know. Reach to people at other campuses and tell them, we're turning out strong for this. Your campus has got to be here, too. you got to be in the streets with us. And we need you to donate money and raise money to make all of this possible. So you got two weeks of work to do to make this possible, to make it happen. See, because it's not going to happen without people, without you all here in this room and people like you throughout the campus, throughout the city, and throughout the country. All of that's got to be in gear to make this happen. And look, let me just end on a personal note. I have been working around the horror of police murder for decades. I have been putting together lists of names. I worked on this book, Stolen Lives, that Nicholas held up. Uh, we have a poster that has dozens of pictures of people killed by police. We started doing hashtags when we got in the computer age, but we started this before we were in the computer age. We do hashtags identifying the women and men who had been murdered by police. I don't want to keep making hashtags. I don't. I don't want to keep adding names to lists of people killed by the police. I don't want to keep having new pictures to put onto those posters. We got to end this, sisters and brothers. I mean, look, I've got an eight-year-old grandchild. I don't want her to grow up and her generation be talking about how the police get away with murder and what we're going to do about it. We have to stop this. That's our charge. And that's what Rise Up October is going to be a big contribution towards. So what we need to do is that everybody here needs to do all that they can to make Rise Up October as powerful as it needs to be and can be. And then we've got to do more than that. That's how important this is. We need to get to a place where when people talk about the history of horrific crimes that this system has inflicted 
on black people and other oppressed people the way that uh, Eve was talking about, they will really be talking about history that has been ended, not history that continues to echo and reverberate in the present. We'll be talking about it in a situation where humanity is emancipated itself. Let's contribute to making that happen, sisters and brothers. Rise up October. Thank you, Mr. Carl Dix, and I take that pledge. Quick reminder, please everybody fill these out and we'll be collecting them in the very back. Let's start a movement. Yeah. All right. Dr. Cornel Wells is a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. He is a professor of philosophy and Christian practice at Union Theological Seminar, Seminary and professor emeritus at Princeton University. He has also taught at Yale, Harvard, and, a, and at the University of Paris. Cornel West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained an MA and a PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written over 20 books and has edited 13. Through, he is the best known for his classics, Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and for his memoirs, Brother West, Living and Loving It Out Loud, and his more recent releases, Black Prophetic File and Radical King, we receive with critical acclaim. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Cole Nair West. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. What a blessing, what an honor. What a privilege to be part of this panel and be in this same room with each and every one of you. I don't know about you, but I've already been deeply moved by the escalating deaths, physical, spiritual, social, psychic deaths. My dear sister, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, pioneering theorist, philosopher of law, truth teller, witness bear. Sister Eve Insula, towering artist, truth teller, crusader for justice. Carl Dix, we've been wrestling with these issues now for almost a decade. We spend some wonderful time in jail together. <laughs> I love him because he's my brother. He's a revolutionary communist. I'm a revolutionary Christian. That's fine. We got strong overlap, very strong overlap. Brother Nicholas Hayward speaks from his soul. Eloquence, of course, at Columbia, you all read Cicero and Quintillian. You know, eloquence means wisdom speaking. And that's what you heard from his soul. No phoniness, no fakery, the real thing. Jamal Joseph, another Columbia professor alongside Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, truth teller. My question for the students here at Columbia University, are you really serious about education? Because education is fundamentally about the formation of your attention. And you tell me what you attend to and I'll tell you who you are. And if you attend to superficial things of just smartness and dollars rather than wisdom and courage and compassion, it's no accident that we live in an ice age when neoliberal ideology generates a callousness toward the plight of poor people and working people and women and indigenous people and immigrants and black people and Arabs and Muslims and Jews too. And that's been characteristic of the last 45 years of our preoccupation with what Wu-Tang Clan says is cream. Cash just rules everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me. But the market culture, this superficial culture of spectacle that doesn't really want to attend to the things that matter, life, death, joy, sorrow, struggle, contestation, what Du Bois calls strivings. No, we turn away. Why? Out of 
cowardlessness. Unfortunately, our universities are not sites that generate the cultivation of courage. They generate the cultivation of being smart and successful and you so easily forget about what you ought to be faithful to, namely something called justice. Don't tell me how smart you are. There was some smart Nazis and smart patriarchs and smart white supremacists. Let the phones be smart. You be wise. You be courageous. That's what Rise Up October is all about. That's what it's all about. It's about a spiritual and moral awakening in a profoundly decadent capitalist civilization in which 1% of the population can have 43% of the wealth but one in two children of color born in poverty. Where's the righteous indignation? Where's the holy anger? Where's the moral outrage? Do you think that's normal that they would be precious children living in the richest nation in the history of the world? Dealing with poverty every day? What is going on? Then you got precious black and brown folk shot down like dogs every 28 hours for 10 years and not one policeman goes to jail on the federal pressure. We did send one to jail in Oakland. That was community pressure over Oscar Grant, but they let him out quick. But then you got a black president, black attorney general, black homeland security. That doesn't deliver justice. The police still getting off scot-free. Doesn't translate with those, place, those black faces in high places. It doesn't translate to justice for poor and working people. Columbia University, I thought you was committed to the truth, and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And if you don't allow the suffering to speak of the folk we talking about, then you're not serious about education. You're not serious about it. You're playing games. I come from a people who have been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized for 400 years in the name of democracy and liberty and equality. The level of hypocrisy here we have to be honest about. And I come from a people who have been fundamentally committed to an unapologetic love. Not just a love of truth in the abstract, but a love of concrete people, because I am who I am because somebody loved me. I don't know about you. I am who I am because somebody cared about me. I don't know about you. What the Isley Brothers call caravan of love, that's the tradition that I come out of. It's a black freedom tradition most hated people in the modern world, and we didn't talk to the world so much about love. Just listen to a little John Coltrane, Love Supreme. Listen to some James Baldwin. Listen to some Audre Lord. Listen to some Mary Lou Williams. Listen to some Aretha Franklin. Teach you something about love. And Brother Martin used to say, justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And this love business ain't no play thing. Because you all know at Columbia that you have to learn how to die in order to learn how to love and think well. And what needs to, what needs to be killed in each and every one of us is the callousness and the indifference and the sense of being afraid and intimidated and scared to tell the truth. And when you really love poor and working people, when you really love the sons of our brother Nicholas, then you hate the fact that they're being treated unfairly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unjustly. And if you don't do something, the rocks are going to cry out. That's the tradition that I come from. That's why I overlap with Brother Carl Dix. People say, oh, Brother West, how is it that you travel around the country for almost a decade and go to jail with Carl Dix? You know he's a revolutionary communist. You know he's an atheist. You know he's deeply committed to secular worldviews. I say, yes, I love my brother. Sometimes it's wrong, but I love my brother. 
because he's on the same love train and most importantly, he's willing to put his body on the line and bear witness to what justice is all about. That's what we're talking about these days. We live in the age of Ferguson. And what is Ferguson? That marvelous new militancy of the younger generation who tired of the spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation of contemporary capitalist civilization. They tired of the emptiness of soul. They tired of the stimulation of bodies and instant gratification. They want something deeper. They want something more profound. They want something like joy, not just pleasure. They want something like justice, not just superficiality. They want something that affects poor and working people, not just some colorful set of faces at on high when folk in the basement still being crushed like cockroaches. That's what we're talking about today. That's why October 24th is crucial because we got to let the know we got to let the powers that be know this talk about police murder and police terror is no fair to fashion. It's a way of life. And we're going to stay at it, and we're going to be faithful unto death, and we're going to die into life. Because as we learn how to die and call in the question our cowardice, call in the question our indifference, call in the question our callousness, we're going to be reborn with new vision, new courage, new determination, new fortitude. But at the same time, and I'm going to end on this note, if love is not at the center of it, it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. I don't want to know just how sophisticated your analysis is. I don't want to know how broad your horizons are. I want to know how deep your love is. Because love is fundamentally about a steadfast commitment to the welfare of others, which means you're willing to take a risk. You're willing to bear a burden. You're willing to pay a price for something bigger than you. That's what this younger generation needs. Columbia University, are you ready for this? Are you ready for the rise of October? Are you ready for the love train? Are you ready for the justice train? Are you ready for teaching the focus on the women and the men and the poor and the gay and the lesbian and the bisexual and all of those who separate? If you ready, come on and get on. Don't need no ticket, just get on board.
All right, we're going to do it like this. When I say rise up, you say October, rise up. Rise up. Rise up. When I say rise up, you say October, rise up. Rise up. Okay, okay, give yourself a round of applause, folks. So my name is Nkosi Anderson. I am a part of the National Steering Committee for Rise Up October. I'm also a part of the uh, Faith Task Force. That's right, thank you, appreciate the love. And I was asked just to make a few quick announcements and just to underscore some points. I won't speak long. Um, is Noche Diaz here? Noche, are you here? Put your hand up, brother. All right. Uh, you all heard his name mentioned earlier, but this is a brother who is a committed freedom fighter. Uh, now, the police and the powers that be, they don't like this brother, and they're trying to pull him down. Uh, he has a couple of outstanding cases that he's facing. Uh, but we want to show this brother that we stand by him, that we love him, and we support him. So let's give him a round of applause. There he is right there. Put your hand up, brother. That's right. That's right. That's right. not expecting that. <clears throat> but they're right. The moment we're in right now is something I've not seen in my lifetime. I've been in many places over the last year and I've talked to youth coming up in this world who for the first time have tasted hope. And that is the very thing that has got the authorities running scared and that is the very thing that they're trying to snuff out and suffocate in the cradle. This is why they've come down harder. This is why they're going after people like me. Because they don't want to see the potential of these youth to come to the stage and come to the fore. They've shown that they can shake the whole world. They have shown that they can wake up whole sections of people who don't face the boot of this. They have shown that they can inspire change and they have shown that they can represent the, the ones who are called the worst of the worst, the thugs, the criminals, those who are capable of nothing, showed us that they are capable of tremendous courage in the face of injustice and a tremendous possibility for a whole new world. This is what cannot be snuffed out. So that the, and then when we rise up in October, and show the world which side are we on. And the next time, and there will be a next time until, they, until we make a revolution, but the next time these cops come into a community and try to gun one of us down or break into our homes and drag away our children the way they did at Manhattanville and Grant Homes just down the block, over 100 people dragged up, facing 20 to life for posting on Facebook. The next time they do that and the youth say, we don't want to take it anymore, they're going to know which side you're on. They're going to know who has their back. They're going to know that when they stand up, they won't stand up alone, and that we can win. Let's give it up for Brother Noche one more time. So we have a petition that's going around, uh, and we encourage you to sign it. It's in support of Noche. Um, you see right here. So make sure you sign that and uh, support this brother. Um, Noche, when's the court date? The, the 13th. October 13th in 100 Center Street, right downtown here in Manhattan. All right. 9 a.m. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, so moving along quickly. Um, we heard about the three days, October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. I just want to quickly reiterate what's going on in those days. 
Thursday, October 22nd, if you look in your seat, you have these cards, it's all there. It's the Stolen Lives, Say Their Names. We're gonna be down in Times Square reading the names of those who have lost their lives to police violence. We want everybody to come out and as we say in the church, witness right there in Times Square to these beautiful lives that live on in our spirits and in the work that we do. 9.30 a.m., thanks. Then on Friday, the 23rd, we're going to shut down Rikers. This is a chance for us to come out and put our bodies on the line. All right, so stay tuned. We're gonna provide more information about that. We want all folks coming out on Friday. Thank you very much, Nellie. Thank you very much, Ms. Bailey. And then, I forgot, that Thursday, again, is the 20th anniversary of the national protest to stop police brutality, repression, and the, gener gener the criminalization of a generation. And so their actions taking place out in Brooklyn as well as across the country. And it's the 20th anniversary, so we need to show up and represent. All right. And then Saturday the 24th, again, 11 a.m., Washington Square Park, flood the streets to stop police terror. We want everybody to come out and be a part of that mass mobilization. Now, I'm going to end like this. Um, I'm also right now a PhD student uh, at Union Theological Seminary right up the street. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you'll also notice that I have my Columbia blue tie on. I graduated the college in 2001, as well as GSAS a few years later. So I personally have a lot invested in seeing Columbia students and students in general really step into that legacy that Professor uh, Joseph was talking about earlier. This is our chance. This is our chance to step up and meet the social challenge of our moment, of our time. So I think we can do it, and I know we're gonna do it. Do y'all believe me, y'all with me? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna end it like this, and I'm gonna step off the stage. When I say justice, you say now. Justice. Now. Justice. Now. When I say justice, you say now. Justice. Now. Justice. Now. When I say rise up, you say October. Rise up. October. Rise up. October. When I say rise up, you say October. Rise up. 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 Powerful night tonight. I just am speechless. Okay. Now we'd like to introduce Professor Sarandrian Morris, better known around Columbia campus as Professor C. Please help me in welcoming Professor C on stage. Hello, hello. As you know, I'm very chill. This jacket got me tight. So, why are we here? We are here because the terror that my grandfather would speak about regarding Jim Crow is back. We are here because 500 people have been killed by police in 2015 and 102 of them are unarmed. We are here because truth be told, Columbia is in Harlem. We are here because media doesn't mention the large number of black women and indigenous folk murdered by cops and all but racist trans women. We are here because little white children and little black children are both absorbing the message that black lives don't matter. We are here because we don't live in vacuums. It's not a state-sanctioned violence on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and a civilian response on Tuesday and Thursday. It's not systematic oppression on Saturday and psychological accumulation on Sunday. And we're here because your respectability won't save you. We are here because we deny that Jim Crow was ever alive and well, and we also continue to deny his much more astute, insidious, and full of polite privilege cousin, James Crow. Because white privilege, polite white privilege, is still white privilege. And y'all know, if you ever took my class, you know I'm a proud New Orleanian. And so we're here because Bush could make it to New Orleans for Katrina 10, but he couldn't make it for Katrina 1. Woo! 
I want to thank Sydney and Jasmine for this. So I teach a class called Power, Oppression, and Privilege. And it's a hub C course. And power, oppression, and privilege really dissects how power, oppression, and privilege cuts across facets of life. So the first thing we do is analyze our knowledge. Because see, everybody up here has the knowledge that counts. We all cut the mustard. I went to Spelman, shout out. And Tulane, not so much of a shout out. And then I wound up at Columbia. So, um, so we talk about knowledge. And, I think the day that Columbia divested all monies from the for-profit prison complex was the day we had class. But the question then became, if Columbia was, has divested money, what does that mean? That it had invested money. So we talked about what that means. Um, and also, pop really reverses power dynamics, and it makes you think about it from a different angle. So I want to thank my students for believing in your professor. Thank you. I love y'all. Y'all like took over the whole little, all in blue shirts. I love you too. Um, so my first question to the panel, whoever wants to answer the, the question. Um, I don't know which one I want to ask first. So Mike Brown had stolen, he had a criminal record, he was a thug, but Dylan Roof was troubled. He was depressed, he was sad and he was hungry, so they fed him Burger King mm -hmm. on the way to the precinct. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how, my first question to the panel is how little brown boys humanity is removed and they're all but not allowed to be children. So the question is how does that shape this idea of black masculinity, young black masculinity? That's my first question. Anybody you want to take a stab at that? Okay, uh, do I need that? First of all, I want to thank you first, uh, Carl, for being in 35 years, you are the third man I've ever heard address rape culture. Okay, so I well, thank you for that. Let me say this to that, don't thank me, challenge the other brothers about why they ain't doing it. Because it's reality. That's why I addressed it, it's reality. And everybody needs to see reality because you have to see reality before you can act to transform it. And if you view it as, well, that's normal. Oh, speaking to the mic. What I was saying is, I don't, I, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm recognizing reality and addressing it. And we got to challenge other men to do the same so that I wouldn't be standing out so much by talking about rape culture because we would all be recognizing the reality of a culture that is chock full of rape. And then the sister wouldn't have to be, <laughs> you know, giving thanks to the few men who do it, because a lot of us will be doing it. That's something we gotta change. In terms of the shaping of black masculinity, being a revolutionary com Okay, they keep telling me I gotta be in the mic. In terms of the shaping of black masculinity, as a revolutionary communist, I step back to the underlying reality that this comes out of, and it's a system, a capitalist system that has no use for whole generations of black people. There used to be a time when they would terrorize you, but they terrorized you to work on the plantation as an enslaved person. Or they terrorized you to work as a sharecropper, to keep you in that place. But today, that those factories that brought us, they brought us out of the South to work in are halfway across the world where they can exploit someone much more viciously than they could here. But then that leaves the generations behind me growing up in the inner cities with no future and no hope. And they remember what my generation did when we were young. And they were like, we don't want to see that again. So we have to move preemptively. And they are doing that through the laws, through the criminal injustice system, the police. But they also are working to justify 
that. And the justification comes down in terms of the demonization of, and I have to go with Sister Kimberly there, while it mainly focuses on the black men, they also demonize black women. Mm -hmm. we, we should see that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that cop who stopped Sandra Bland found it horrible that that sister didn't know her place. Mm -hmm. And he acted on that. So that's what I see happening. I see the justification for the suppression of people that this system hates and fears. And that justification then, Mike Brown becomes a demon that that cop was justified in blowing away, you know. And you can see the same thing. Tamir Rice is a 12-year-old boy, but I am sure when the case gets to court, because I've already heard the police union representative talk about, well, he was kind of big for a 12-year-old boy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like that was a reason to kill him. He was a large 12-year-old boy, which is a historic thing with black people, as, as you know. Mothers would become afraid if their boys would grow up to be big because they knew they were going to be targets. So that's what I would say. Kim? So, so I, just, I just want to suggest we do a thoughts experiment for a moment. Um, let, let's imagine that um, instead of Dylan Roof walking into uh, Mother Emmanuel uh, in Charleston, uh, that Mike Brown uh, walked into some Episcopalian church and killed nine white people. Yes. Six of them women. Mm -hmm. um, saying something about, you know, this is payback for whatever. Mm -hmm. Do we think that a discourse of forgiveness, of grace, Mm. Uh, of they've forgiven us would be enough to quell the absolute outrage that would overtake this country. Come on, somebody. If a black man had done that to six white women, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the way that Dylan Roof has been framed, has been treated, the, the Hamburg, none of that would happen if a black man had done that. So that, that's telling us stuff about masculinity, hyper-masculinity, mm -hmm. the whole idea of the super predator, which we have to remember academics were partly responsible for creating this mm. myth that there was going to be this whole group of black male super predators, which underwrote this incredible effort to criminalize African-American men and boys especially, also Latinos, right? So, so there is that, but we also have to realize that the flip side of that is the way in which patriarchy contributed to that narrative that Dylan Roof went in there and killed people about. Remember he said, you rape our women. Yes. He was doing it in the name of white women. Yes. He was doing it to black women. Mm -hmm. So race is something that takes place not just between men, but between women as well. And it's one of the most important reasons why anyone who considers themselves a feminist needs to see police violence, private violence, all forms of racist violence as a feminist issue. It. it is a feminist issue. So there have been 3,000 people who have signed a letter called the Charleston Imperative. Eve Insler was one of the leading feminists behind that. We need to make sure these movements are not separated, that feminists stand with us against racist violence, and that those of us against racist violence stand with feminists against gender-based violence, all forms of gender-based violence. That is what a real movement looks like. No, I just want to um, add just one thing to that. You know, I, I found this beautiful quote by Audre Lord today, which I was going to say earlier, but it ties very much into what Kim is saying. She said, some problems we share as women, some we do not. You white women fear your children will grow up to join the patriarchy and testify against you. We fear our children will be dragged down from a car and shot down in the street, and you will turn your backs on the reason they are dying. Ending police brutality is a feminist issue. Make no mistake about it. And where we join our movements is what she says at the end. 
We will not turn our backs on the reason they are dying. That is a feminist issue. So I just want to really echo what Kim was saying. Mm -hmm. This issue of the vicious legacy of, of, of patriarchy cannot be overestimated, but I do want to bring in this issue of class alongside white supremacy and uh, male supremacy. And I say this, that Michael Brown on that street for four and a half hours with his blood flowing and the dogs urinating on him and his mama don't have access to him, that he was a brother our brother, a human being, who was from the working poor chocolate side of Ferguson. It is different for upper middle class black brothers and sisters. All black people are disrespected, but the black poor and working poor are criminalized and demonized in a way the black upper middle class is not, just in terms of education. I'm so glad to see the, the, the black faces here. I salute each, each and every one of you. But you all know in America, rich kids get taught and poor kids get tested. So, so, so the very educational system that you got to get to Columbia has a class structure to it. Doesn't mean you work hard, ought not to work hard, doesn't mean you ought not to be a freedom fighter, but you have to be cognizant of the structures there's an educational system that produces soul murder every day to precious poor black and brown and white children. And therefore, police feel as if they can get away with criminalizing black poor brothers and sisters more so than the black upper classes. Everybody knows. I mean, if you Jack and Jill brothers and sisters, and I love my Jack and Jill brothers and sisters. You Jack and Jill brothers and sisters, and if Jack and Jill brothers and sisters were going to jail at the same level of intensity as the black poor, there'd be different kind of black leadership. Different kind of black leadership, because the black leadership is black upper middle class and primarily speaks to upper middle class interests. That's why uh, the majority of the black congressional cau uh, caucus voted for the militarization of the local police department with the Obama administration given green light. We got to tell the truth. So the issue of class is crucial. And if you come from the tradition that produced me, I'm talking about Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin Luther King Jr., Ida B. Wells Barnett, that says a poor black brother and sister has exactly the same status as a black upper middle class brother and sister, and I'm going to be as outraged as precious Jamal and Letitia get mistreated as I am somebody out of Exeter, Andover, and some other private prep school. Glad the Negroes are there, but hope they don't get so miseducated that they lose sight of the solidarity they ought to have with their poor brothers and sisters. Kim. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I work like I love you. You know that. Why what is the benefit of erasing the voices of women or positioning them where media makes this seem like unarmed black folk being shot are primarily men? Yeah, yeah. Well, you and know And trans women. And trans women. Absolutely. So you know, um, as I was saying earlier, one, one of the ways that we understand issues is through the frames that we have historically had. Um, so generally speaking, when people think about police violence, they think about it as a contemporary extension of lynching, and in many ways it is, right? Um, the problem is that we have tended to think about extrajudicial violence lynching as only something that happens to men. What happened to Natasha McKenna was a lynching. It happened to her in an institutional space. It happened to her with people uh, wearing hazard, hazardous suits, biohazardous suits. It happened while she was handcuffed. That's as much of a lynching as someone being shot in the street or hanging on a tree. But one of the reasons we don't see it as that 
is number one, we think all that lynching stuff happened a long time ago. Number two, we buy into the narratives that the person had it coming to them in one way or the other. They fell out of the racial script. And the only question is whether the punishment that they got for falling out of the racial script was legitimate or not, or excessive or not. But the possibility that people did nothing wrong whatsoever, the story we heard about the brother here and his son, the story we hear about Tanisha, the story we hear over and over again about women who are simply calling for help, that really explodes the argument that the police give. It makes it that much harder for unions, union reps, to be angry at a father of a black child for telling the black child that they need to be careful every time they have an encounter with a police, right? Because it makes it seem as though the police have justification for killing us in the way we do. So if we broaden the frame and talk about all the different ways that people lose their lives, we get it out of this, we were just fighting crime. Maybe we were overzealous. We had to protect ourselves. What justification is there for someone to walk in someone's house and shoot them through the heart? That is not about fighting crime. That is not about suppressing masculinity. That's not about protecting police officers. That's just about repression. So if we bring the full range of ways that everybody is subject to police violence, it helps disrupt this myth so we're not constantly stuck in the conversation, did he have his hands up or not? Did he have a record for stealing cigarettes? All of these things are part of the narrative that says the reason why it happens disproportionately to us is because we disproportionately commit crime. We know that's not the reason why we get killed. So putting women, all women in the mix helps us do that. Knowing their names helps us do that. And if you want to know the names, get our report. It's in the back of the hall. And, and join Say Our Name so that we can march together um, on, on the 24th. Say Her Name is part of the uprising. We need to make sure that we have the names to be able to be part of that. And also, we can extend that to when we talk about the silencing of trans women, extend that to how gender identity intersects with race, intersects with the fact that now we have men who have given up the golden ticket of masculinity. How dare you give up the golden ticket in exchange for femininity? How dare you choose to live a life where you once had masculinity in exchange for that and almost like you deserved what you got because you gave up the golden ticket of masculinity, which is often why we see, we talk about in pop, we see trans women murders way more grotesque than just, oh, a bullet to the head. We see dismemberment. We see a head here, an arm here. A trans woman just got killed in Philly today. Black trans woman. And so what does this narrative then say about gender identity and how it does or does not intersect with, intersect with sexuality? So I think that's part of this whole idea of like, Femininity, whatever, you deserve it. Um, yeah, thank you. So we have an announcement. Do any, does anyone have any last comments before our announcement? Because we have, to shift, we, we have had to shift the program a little bit. Any panelists have any burning things they want to get off their chest? Does the audience have questions? Y'all got some questions? Is that all right? Maybe we can do, right, maybe we can do two audience questions. Okay, that's cool. Scream it out. You can just scream it out from where you are. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Just get to a mic. Thank you. This is a lot of people. Um, <laughs> so, um, my question actually might not even be directed at anybody that's sitting on the panel because you guys have done your work. We read your work, we use your work in our fights every day. But you guys are Columbia students. 
I'm a student at BMCC. Um, I'm one of those people who is queer. I'm of color. Um, I've seen handcuffs, felt handcuffs, more than any of you in this room. And it blows my mind how scared I am to apply to this school because you guys don't stand up in your classrooms and call shit out that happens consistently. But that's not really why I got up here. I just got up here to ask the question, like, how complicit are you willing to be? How silent are you willing to be after the protests happen, after we come together and stand in solidarity, after you feel good about it and make a hashtag, put a post on your page that I did, I went to a protest today and I stood with black people. What are you gonna do in your everyday life consistently to eradicate white supremacy? Because we haven't said it yet. And nobody's addressed this question to you. We've talked about a lot of stuff that's been building us up, and I'm glad that you guys are willing to stand in solidarity. I'm glad that you showed up. But I'm the poor kid that they're talking about. I grew up, and I'm making myself vulnerable here, and I don't have to do this. I grew up on the street, and everybody's telling me Columbia's gonna be the greatest place in the world. Why is Columbia gonna be the greatest place in the world? Are you gonna make it that place for me? Are you gonna uplift? People of color, are you going to uplift the people that you see in your classrooms? Are you going to up, like, what are you doing in your day to day? You know what I mean? I just, it blows my fucking mind that I see, and I, and I apologize for cursing, but it's the passion that's here and the eloquence that's absent. But I need to know that you're going to do more than come to see these folks whose names you already know. Because I exist in your neighborhood and you call it Morningside Heights. This is Harlem. It's been gentrified. That's pretty much thank it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. We only have time for one more question. And I believe you were first. Thank you. Uh, my name is Genji. I'm here from the Chicago chapter of the Stop Mass Incarceration Network. I really want to thank Professor Crenshaw for everything you've said. It's really important. Um, and I, I had a general question for all of you in terms of what can we all do in our rhetoric and our organizing. I've been working trying to bring LGBT groups into this movement, and some of them, you know, are understandably skeptical about whether there's a place for them at the table. How do we help illustrate both to the people we talk to and to people already in this room that? Um, patriarchy, that white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia are just four different walls of the same cage. And they're all just co-extensions of people being criminalized and stigmatized, not for anything they've done, but for who they are, for the privilege of certain bodies over others. And I do have to ask a particular question of uh, Professor West. I've seen you out uh, campaigning for Senator Sanders. I've seen what you've done for him. I want to know uh, what he's going to do for us. Where's his endorsement of us? We have Jill Stein and the Green Party have signed on with Rise Up October. Is there any chance that we can get a candidate from one of the major parties to sign on as an endorser of Rise Up October and use his platform to bring the spotlight to these families? in terms of knocking down those walls, though, I, I think that we have to be both morally consistent, we have to be in genuine solidarity with people catching hair, I don't care who they are, it has to do sexual orientation, it could be bisexual, it could be trans, it could be poor white, it could be Palestinians under Israeli occupation, it could be Jews in France catching hell, it could be peasants in Mexico. The question is really more in your praxis, by your fruits you shall know them. There's already very important voices from uh, lesbian and gay and, and bi uh, and, 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 and transgender within the black freedom struggle. I mean the Black Lives Matter itself, you know, two of them founded by two to queer sisters. So I mean, it, it's not like you got to look outside. It's, it's always been on the inside, but it has to be all embracing and, and, and it, it has to be one that keeps track of the humanity of each and every one of us. Now in terms of Bernie Sanders, you and I know that when it comes to the pickings of our politicians, the bar is pretty low. Very, very, very low. You know, you got xenophobes and 
mean-spirited, cold-hearted, right-wing Republicans. You got milquetoast, neoliberal Democrats. Who's left? Brother Bernie. He the only one left, you know. Now, th that doesn't mean that we don't have to push our dear brother. When he talks about Wall Street, he's hitting it. When he talks about free education and public, he's hitting it. When he's talking about single health payer, he's hitting it. When he's talking about escalating wages as profits go up, he's hitting it. But he's not a revolutionary in the way which Carl Dix is. You know, he's pink, he's not red, you know what I mean? He's, he's democratic socialist uh, and social democrat. Uh, when it comes to Israeli occupation, we got to put pressure on Brother Bernie. You know what I mean? We just got to put pressure on him. When it comes to our precious uh, lesbian sisters and gay brothers and others, we got to put some tremendous pressure on him. There's no doubt to me, though, that um, the time that I spent with my brother, that he really is a person of integrity, which is not to say I, I, I agree with everything, but he, he leans in the right direction. And that's what I mean. Now, Jill Stein, I have tremendous respect for. In fact, I'm going to be in Georgia. I'm going now to Georgia just uh, in a few weeks to uh, support uh, Jill Stein's attempt to get her name on the ballot in Georgia, because I think people ought to have a right to choose. And so I'll be there with Brother Bruce, Brother Bruce Dixon of Black Agenda Report and so forth. Uh, but that's just a matter of my just trying to be uh, morally consistent. But I, I actually think that given the uh, our decadent capitalist civilization that Bernie is a real uh, a light and I think he can win now when he wins of course I'm gonna be his major critic because I'm fighting against the system I'm not just talking about one individual politician the whole system needs to be transformed but I think in fact he is in many ways a force for good in some ways he would be what some people thought Obama was going to be and didn't turn out to be that's what's fascinating about it a Jewish brother from Brooklyn ends up being a stronger force for good than a brilliant, charismatic, milquetoast, neoliberal Obama from Chicago. Ooh, that's a fascinating contrast, isn't it? I'm going with the Jewish brother from Brooklyn all the way down, but could, putting pressure on him all the way down, too. But I appreciate your question, though. <laughs> Just briefly, do I need the black microphone? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the first part of her question, the way we break down the walls between the different ways in which people get come at is that we go to the reality. Because there ain't no big wall between that, there has just been one built up to say that, well, that's your issue over there and it's not mine, my issue is over here. Mm -hmm. No, the reality is that this is all intertwined. We're dealing with a system that enforces all of these horrors. You know, that's why I tried to start out the way that I did in terms of the sweep of the horrors. And we have to act to end them all. We cannot say, look, white people in this audience, like when Tamir Rice got killed, I felt like I had lost the grandchild. If you're the right age group, that's how you should feel too. If you're younger, you could feel like you lost the sibling but you lost a part of your family because we're talking about the human family here. That's right. That's and all of us are in this together and we have to right. begin to act and feel, feel that way and act on it. So when a trans woman is killed, it's not like, oh, wait a minute, she's trans. How do I react to that? It's like an injustice has been committed, you know? And it is, a, it is real, again, go to the reality that trans people are disproportionately attacked by police and in fact attacked because they're trans. Mm -hmm. This is reality Absolutely. and we have to act on that reality. That's how we got to go at that. And then just briefly on the, on the second part, look, we got to stop looking for saviors to come in and take care of this for us. We have to act to save to emancipate ourselves. That's what we got to do, you know. And I just remember Bernie Sanders is trying to be head of the U.S. empire. And think about what that means. You know, and, and I said the same thing about Obama when he was campaigning and there was a lot of whoop about him. Like, hey, he's trying out to be head of the empire and he might make it and if he makes it, 
then what role is he going to play? I, I, okay, I just I want to just want to add one thing about solidarity and breaking down um, structures between movements. And what I want to say is, I think a lot of times in this country, um, we we get organized or we organize in the structures of our oppressor. Uh, Neoliberal capitalism wants everything to be branded and siloed and separated and competing because that's how neoliberal capitalism operates. So even the funding streams that support social movements set that structure up, okay? Our job as activists and revolutionaries is to refuse to be siloed and to understand that there is one story we are all struggling in and within. There is one story. And that has to do with ending, in my opinion, rape culture. And we're talking about the rape of the earth. We're talking about the rape of black bodies by police. And over, we're talking about the rape of women. We're talk, we can go down the list. But we can, we can put whatever frame around it on that particular hour, on that particular day. But it's the same story. And I think one of the things I'm learning the longer I'm alive is that Everybody knows the thing that drives you and you're passionate about, what that driving issue is. So you take the lead there. When we're in solidarity, when that's not our lead, we serve over there. We go and we serve. We ally up. We say, how do you want me to be? Tonight it was like, what do you want me to do here? I'm allying up here, right? There's other moments where I'm taking the lead and I want allies to come in and ally up with me. And part of it is knowing when to shut up and serve and when to take the lead. And white people need to learn when to shut up and serve. Come on, yes. You better preach. Um, so we have an announcement. Is anyone else? Sorry, we don't have any time for. Okay, one more question. This woman, where did she go? She Nella had a question. She had a. You had a. Yeah, we could just. No, this woman. Had Uh, that all of you have spoken about Columbia University six billion dollar expansion into West Harlem is something that's very real hundreds and hundreds of blacks and Latinos have been displaced black businesses have been displaced churches have been displaced and driven out Columbia University has a biotech research laboratory five stories underground in which they are experimenting with dangerous pathogens such as SARS and Ebola. We know that the earth, uh, that the sea levels are rising. There are no levees. That is in a flood plain area. And for you students, your most natural allies are the people who are just blocks away from you, working class, blacks and Latino people who are being pushed out and displaced by Columbia University. For 10 years, we worked against the expansion of Columbia University. We never had a program like this, but we marched on Lee Bollinger's house. We were on campus, but the fight isn't over. That is the most natural ally that you have. And if you truly want to be a member of this human race and not just someone who is learning rote and has nothing to do with the reality of what's going on around you, critical thinking that is needed, you will join us in this struggle of Columbia University displacement because we know in Harlem that they have the police there protecting property. That's why they are there. That is why they are on every single corner in Harlem. That is why they are harassing black men, women, and mostly youth every single day in Harlem. So if you want to know reality in New York City, less than 10 blocks away from you, you go to Harlem. You don't have to go to the Red Rooster, but you go into the projects and you talk to your brothers and sisters. 
Those are our, are our allies in every single structure, struggle that we have. The working class people, the intersection of race and class, that is what we are here for. Thank you. I heard a statistic once that Columbia is the largest landowner in Manhattan next to NYCHA. Third largest landowner in Manhattan. And if you have taken pop, you have talked about how us, I'm not from New York, so how us moving into Harlem contributes to gentrification. Columbia is amazing, my friend that goes to BMCC, Columbia is amazing at racial diversity. School of Social Work, I will admit, yes. is more racially diverse than many other departments I've seen, especially in Ivy Leagues, but Columbia is horrible at social class diversity. I remember sitting in POP one day and a student who had probably been to one or two max cultural competency classes said, Professor Z, I think it's really bad that we are talking about poor people in their absence. And if you were in class that day, you know that I turned to my own student who I love and said, your professor is poor. So the thought that poor people don't exist at Columbia, <laughs> and also this, I thank you for calling a spade a spade, for saying, you are the reason why I don't want to pursue Columbia. And my observation is, so you know in pop, we use words like racist. We use words like white supremacist. We don't skirt around stuff, because I don't really have time for that. But I thank you for calling a spade a spade. And I will say my observation from being up here is that a whole bunch of people of color are clapping, standing up, and a whole bunch of white people are sitting down. And I challenge white folk to check their privilege all the time. I chose Columbia not because I value the ivory tower versus anything else, but because I need to galvanize a group of powerful white allies in a way that will shift the trajectory of the world. Many days I wish I could just go teach at my alma mater. It's an HBCU. It happens to be the number one in the country, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> you went to Spelman, girl? Yes, yes. <laughs> Spelman is in the house. But because I would be somewhat preaching to the choir, but because I want to get to that white male who sits in my class, who looks at me and says, Professor, I've never talked about racism. The thought of being 20-something years old and never having to confront racism is beyond me, but that's beside the point. So that is why I'm here. And thank you for calling a spade a spade. I just want to shout out that we have over 140 people watching this live, which includes my community, LA, East LA, South LA. I'm very proud. We also want to say that this, this conversation is not over. Not only will we be organizing for uh, Rise Up October, but we also are going to continue this conversation. We understand that we are the, the students, the community members, the, the, these voices need to be heard, and we are at time constraints. But I'm going to have a sign-up sheet. We're going to pass these around. If we can get emails, I'll make sure that we're, a conversation is had on the Columbia campus um, to continue this with community members and everyone here and abroad watching um, are welcome. So we're definitely going to continue this conversation and make sure we're having these dialogues, but we're not just going to be talking. We will be rising up on October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. So in the spirit of Asada Shakur, I need y'all to stand to y'all feet. And I need you to repeat after me. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. 
We must love and protect each other. We've got nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you.